thanks stefan for the invitation i really appreciate it and i'm looking forward to be part of the conference the work what work uh, what we are going to present in this presentation is to see how we are engaging fmeas or from the failure mode analysis and into bayesian networks and then try to see that how we can do fault detection and fault, fault isolation because what's happening is we as part of our group we have been working in the area of fault diagnosis and prognostics for a very long time and what as we go forward in the us space or this airspace we do see that there are several failures which are happening and as we go through the presentation I'll talk through our example also so to start with just to give an overview hopefully this should work yeah so just to give an overview i'll talk about some background what fmeas are how we are integrating that into bayesian networks what are the different modeling approaches what we are looking into any issues what we are finding out based on what the application is and then the one of the case studies what we have taken here is about an m system systems are basically the future aircrafts the passenger taxis what we are calling them and how we need to have a good uh, diagnosis and fault detection on these vehicles because they are going to fly very close to urban areas and i'll talk about that we have a case study scenario where we'll see into failures and how are we trying to compute the, the probabilities for them so with the current forecast there is a suggestion suggests that there are going to be lot of u type of vehicles or this urban or air taxis what they call which will enter the airspace and they are going to operate at a very high frequency so they are going to operate from the small urban areas and then just be going to the city center or they'll be going to the airports and you will have this multiple volte ports which will be placed along the line and with this high frequency of this vehicle moving around there is a lot of key goal or a key critical element which is for the reliability of the vehicle and to look into how this ua or the subsystems in this you are held to the highest safety standards because they are going to fly at this low altitudes any fault in the system which occurs the vehicle will have very less time for making any decision to land to the closest possible area so what we have to do is to identify what the fault is what is the magnitude of the fault and is the fault good enough that it can get the vehicle to its closest vertical port or it's bad that we need to get very close and land the vehicle a safe place because we are going to carry passengers it's going to be getting affected by who is in the vehicle but as well as who is on the ground because we are very close to the ground we are not more than 5000 feet above ground and these vehicles they are not like gliders they they don't have fixed wings so they don't have a glide path so they need to be landed in a safe as, as safe as possible and also the diagnosis system needs to look into what the fault is or what the unexpected failure is and then try to get a performance of fault detection using what sensor data is available so the first part of the problem is to identify or to detect and identify the fault and the next part of the problem which is and continuation of this is prognostics which is i know what's the fault in the system i know where the fault is can i estimate or can i predict what's going to happen to that fault in the next 15 minutes or in the next half an hour or in the next 5 minutes depending on what type of fault it is but the very key element of this part is what the fault is and where the fault is and that's something what we are trying to demonstrate or present in this this work as a very basic flow chart what we have so we identify and quantify the effects of potential hazards based on the severity likelihood and the root cause so that's the schematic diagram we have we have the fha and the fmea we perform the functional hazard analysis for for the specific vehicle and this could be for any complex system but from our point of view we are looking at this urban air mobility vehicles develop an fmea which is based on an fha where you look into the reliability analysis and other sources of causes for failure in the system and this is an iterative process so we will keep on updating because we will have the schematics we will have updates from the oems basically depending on what components are part of this system so those are integrated together to give a overview of the whole vehicle 
The next part is to develop an, a Bayesian framework for uh, this FDI or the fault detection and identification based on the FMEA information supplied. Develop a diagnostic as well as a prognostic system with uncertainty quantification for systems health management. So this is based on a physics model which is developed for each of the systems. So we do have a capability to develop these physics models. We took an example of a powertrain in this specific example for the FMEA because we do have very good battery models. We do have very good motor models and we do have the speed controllers, which are called the ESC specifically. So any speed controllers, what we are using. So we have developed these models over the period of time. And these all come together because once you know the underlying physics, then you are able to identify what the core fault is. So from the data, from the sensor data, we are able to identify where the fault is and what system has the fault. And then once you go down to the model, we are able to identify and isolate the specific fault in the system and which we'll see as we go forward. In this work, we are trying to discuss of integrating information from the design of future UA vehicles using subsystems in our diagnostics framework. The first part is to design phase doesn't most of the time why we are using this is because most of the time design work doesn't incorporate any diagnosis consideration or any future consideration. So we would like to have that as part of our design framework. And also it's often developed later in the product life cycle where it's retrofitted in, in the later stages. So you have the whole design process. And then at some point in time, oh, we have to add this capability to diagnose the problem or to see what the system health is. So in case we start that at the right in the design process itself, we are able to then specify where the sensor could be placed or what the sensor number would be required because when we are flying some vehicle, we have to optimize on what is the weight of the vehicle because the weight of the vehicle is key, especially when you are flying this short vehicles, but also if it's electric power, then you have to be specific on what the battery, the battery itself will have a lot of weight. So any additional sensors or any redundant sensors would add weight to the vehicle. So if that is optimized in the start of the design process itself, then techniques like these, what we are trying to develop, could be implemented with the minimum number of sensors. In this work, we are, what we are trying to do is integrate the information from the design and then we get it back. But then how do you embed an FMEA with a Bayesian network? What we are trying to do is to take that information, what we are not able to get there, and then nodes in the network, they would represent basically, depending on where the sensors are placed, each sensor would be defined as a node where it will have a failure node and it will have the root cause and effect. So then we can chart the whole structure of that vehicle or that subsystem and then develop causal relationship between the nodes through the connecting edges. And I'll talk about the example as we go forward. To start off, the next step is basically to identify the weak links within the subsystem. And an example of this is the UM powertrain, which is consists of the batteries, the speed controllers and the motors that leads to failure and develop sources or resources to reduce the chance of potential failure occurring at those links. The FMEA table, basically on this example, what we are looking at, it will have, we are trying to get is uh, the quadrotor of the electric uh, vehicle, which we'll talk about it. And what we are trying to do is define the equipment level to facilitate development of uh, any functional failures. So we are looking at this functional failures based on a set standard. So based on the SAE J179, we looked at that standard and we narrowed the scope of FMEA to recognize what the potential faults will be or what the potential failures would be and what their effects would be. So this is the prior information which is available. So we are trying to collect that information as much as possible. So that would depend on what the failure or degradation mode is or what that rate is, what are the different failure effects, uh, what is the severity, what are the different causes because if it's you can can have multiple causes for the same failure. What is the frequency of the failure? What is the detectability? Can we detect those faults? Because if the sensor is not placed at that specific point, then probably we need to have measurements either prior to somewhere earlier in the system or later down in the in some cascadic fashion. But then can we retrieve or can we isolate the fault based on that cascaded information? 
So we have to look into that option also. And what is the risk priority? What, what is the risk of the different or the priority system in a priority order? And if that's the case, which fault gets the highest priority? So if it's a, if it's a battery in a powertrain, then the battery gets the highest priority as opposed to a speed controller or a motor, because if the motor has a failure, it can still run. But if a battery has a failure, probably it's not even to go into power the whole system or the whole vehicle. So we have to prioritize that part. <coughs> also, in some cases, the failures rates that we are trying to get them, we get them through uh, manufacturers of the subsystems, as we uh, discussed earlier, while some are defined based on similarities or any other systems. And that's what we are trying to learn. And the good part about this framework is the, it, the framework keeps on updating as more and more information is uh, added to it. So it's a very uh, dynamic framework. And that's the reason we try to get it in the Bayesian network, in the Bayesian network framework, so that as more and more information is updated, either from the manufacturer or from the operation of the system itself, we will be setting up the priorities or the failure priorities will keep on changing. And in the future, what we are trying to do is when once the actual failure rates are obtained, we will be able to generate that output. So that output keeps on iterating. And we saw that in our the flow chart, what we looked at. In this case, what we have is each node is a proposition or a variable. So that's the basics of the underlying basics of the Bayesian framework. The arc indicates the causal relationships and the strengths. So we have the causal relationships between each of the connecting nodes. And then we have the ancestors and the descendants based on how the arcs are connected or how the connections are done. Then we have the joint, joint probability distribution. So we have the joint PDF. And then based on that joint PDF, we are given a proposition where we have a certain information known. For example, we have what is X2 equal to one, and then we can calculate what is the that probability of the joint PDF for that specific node or the or within the system. So this is the generalized framework, which I'm sure everyone is aware of. And how do we put that in a perspective of from the FMEA into a Bayesian network? So what we do is we have, we transform the FMEA, the qualitative information, which is available from the FMEA into the information of the nodes. So then we have uh, different causes, so which are on the top rank, and then the, the effects are on the bottom side. So we have the parent and the node connection or the parent uh, connection between each of the nodes. And if you see that those relationships between the nodes are defined by connecting what different failures are. So you may have a same failure. So you may have failure on mode one, which may be due to cause one and cause two. And that, that's how the systems are. So we have that causal, causal uh, relationship observed. Then that information from the FMEA is then transformed into a prior marginal probabilities, uh, which are for the root causes and the conditional probabilities for all the other nodes. So based on what the prior probabilities are, which you get it from either applying the, running those experiments or running some experiments in the labs where you have some knowledge of the background of what that component is doing or what that component is going to implement for. And then also some information from the manufacturer where you have some reliability information of the failure rates. And we try to incorporate both of that in from both the local experiments as well as from the manufacturers into a single group and then try to distribute that failure probabilities on these nodes or structure what we have developed. So once that's done, then the next step is to have a dependency among the way the elements which is not restricted to deterministic relationship so we can have if we go to the nodes back for the x1 and x2 <coughs> each one of them would have their own failure probabilities depending on which failure mode or failure node is active and that can be defined between the these elements and we can have the whole tabular form based on what the system is so look to look at the system, let's see what the system looks like. So in our case study, what we looked at was this whole UM vehicle. So the UM vehicle 
uh, if you look at it, even the basic structures, you will have the avionics, which is the avionics electronics, which is controlling all the uh, different components of the system, uh, vehicle. You have the structure. So what the vehicle is made up of. So you have carbon fiber, you have may have some uh, reinforcement material. So you can uh, actually do some diagnosis on that. You have actuators because you have some fixed wing, we have tilt wings, you have the landing gear. So those actuators or the motors, they are part of it. And then the final comes the, the powertrain, which is the key where you have your batteries, your speed controllers, your motors. So what we did was we are looking at the, though we are looking at the vehicle at, for, uh, from the complete overview, we divided that into these four underlying structures or underlying key elements. And out of that, we selected powertrain as one of our case studies. So in this case, what we are trying to look into is we developed that FMEA uh, details. So that was based on what the component is. So if you look at we have the battery, what are the different faults? So we may have a state of charge fault or a state of health fault. And then the root cause may be different because depending on what type of failure is observed, the root cause will change because when we have vehicle moving from one point to another, we will see the state of charge, which is changing over the period of time because you are drawing energy from it. But then the state of health may not change at that point of time. So you would see the state of charge going down or as the vehicle moves from one, one point to another. But in the other case, and then your severity would be different because depending on what type of severity you have, you will be having, sorry, my, my son came here. So depending on what type of fault it is, your severity would be either high, it will be low, or it would be medium, depending on what type of fault it is. So to look into that, then we have the battery pack, then we have the motors, then we have the speed controllers, and then the last point is the, the conditional electronic system. So the CES, what we call it. And we this chart is for the powertrain, but we can have that for multiple systems. And as we can see from this picture, we have multiple motors. So you will have uh, multiple charts which will be associated with it, depending on how the systems are connected. In case of a quad rotor, we would have four motors, we would have their speed controllers, we would have us and their electronic system or the controlling system. And then we have the battery packs. So the, those battery packs, again, would have their own state of like, uh, battery pack one battery pack two battery pack three will have their own root causes and faults associated with that so then it becomes a big connective connection of uh, the systems then we what we can do is we can have the, those divided into multiple systems or subsystems and that's when we can do some subsystem level diagnosis so we can break down the system we can break once you break down the system we can do a system level diagnosis but then we can also get a fault isolation so we can do fault detection and then we can do fault isolation where the, you can actually point it to a specific motor or a specific battery depending on how the fault is observed once we have the overall structure now we are looking at how we are based on what defined prior and conditional probabilities based on the data sheets and the manufacturer's inputs and the expert knowledge, how we are able to achieve the this fault isolation. <coughs> At the top, again, we as we once are basically flight, you may see data chemical reaction which is happening within the battery for the so blue ones are false for the motors the red ones are for the the red ones are for the motors the blue ones for the batteries and then the green ones or the light greens one what that's for the speed controllers so any change in the battery would be due to chemical reaction which is happening within the battery which may lead to degradation in the batteries due to a flight profile because if you are flying from point a to point b if you have windy condition if there is some weather up front you may be drawing a high current the batteries may be drawing high current and that would lead to the state of charge depleting over a period of time and then that's how the connection would be but that would also affect if you're drawing higher current then the battery also 
gets affected by the health. So its state of health would also decrease. And how are we monitoring that? So we are monitoring it through the sensors. So we have our temperature sensor, we have the current and then the voltage. So VB, IB and TB, those are the currents, those are the sensors which are actually being, which are measuring the parameters for the batteries. Similar to that, we have any operational conditions for the motor. So depending on, is it a high stress operation or a low stress operation that would affect the bearings. So if you have a anus or asynchronous motors, then those will be get affected because uh, the bearing may have a fault. If there is a debris in the, depending on operational condition, if you're flying in a, there is a dust particles or high, high um, uh, dirt uh, probability of getting into it, that would affect how the bearings get failure would be observed. Other uh, could be high temperatures would lead to winding resistance. And how are they monitored? They are again monitored through these three parameters, which is voltage, the temperature and the current. The moment you start seeing high, the bearings getting faulty, the bearings will have a high friction rate. The more the friction would happen, motor casing will start heating up. And that's where we can observe that, okay, TM is the temperature is rising. In, as opposed to that, we may also see a rising temperature because there is a winding resistance. So if the winding resistance, there is a shot in the battery in the motor windings, or if there is a laker itself gets starts to open up, we would see some shot and that would lead to change in the resistance. Again, changing the resistance would then happen do you lead to high temperature because then there's high current flowing but then we are observing that that change in the current and then the voltage would also change and similar to the third point is depending on what the stress on the speed controller is so if you have a high current flowing then the speed controllers will also start heating up and we would see that happening through these three <clears throat> sensors which are on the speed controllers and we what we try to do is this same exact system is something what we have on our small uav vehicles currently what we are testing out so this algorithm doesn't try to use any additional sensors so whatever the sensors are available on the vehicle we try to use those spe specific sensors so it's we could have used more sensors because then you can have a torque sensor and you can have an rpm but that information is currently not available on the vehicle but over the period of time, if that sensor gets added up, our, if the RBZ network is able to update it. So it's dynamic from that point of view, because then you can add another node and have the failure probabilities then distributed and updated as we have that additional information. And another very good point about this equation, or which I'll talk later, is that in case you have your state of health or the for the battery, are degrading so then what happens is the next time you have the same failure or you observe the same failure the probability of that failure being battery then another any component down the line would have increased because that information is updated as we go through each flight cycle or each discharge cycle for the battery so we keep on updating that information and that will change the failure probabilities depending on how the vehicle is operated in the specific conditions so once you have this information, this structure developed, then the next part is computing the conditional, conditional probabilities given what the sensor-based faults are. So in this case, what we what we looked at was there was an anomalous voltage reading in both in all the three voltages. That was a fault which was injected in the system. So we had a VE, which a VB, which is a voltage on the battery, VE, which is voltage on the speed controllers, and VM is the voltage on the motors. So all the three faults were shown as one so when we did the probability or we calculated the conditional probabilities then we are able to rank the conditional probabilities so this is the ranking what we get so what is the probability of each fault being there so the highest probability is basically for the state of charge the next one is for the state of health and then the third one is for the motor winding getting short so there is a shot in the winding so based on the list of the probabilities these three are the top three and then what fault isolation can do is it can the it selects the highest probability fault and then it's able to use that information for the prognoser and then the prognoser is able to predict that okay i know that there is a fault in the system prognoser kicks in and what the prognoser does is then it calculates what's my remaining useful life remaining useful life is another another topic where where prognosis it's same prognosis is very similar to that okay if i'm sick how much time it will 
take me for getting better. So that's prognostics uh, that the doctor, whenever you are sick, he'll tell you, okay, you take this medicine and you'll be okay. My prognosis is that within three or four days, you will you'll feel better or you'll be back to normal. A prognosis is exactly the same that it does only in the opposite way that based on my current state of health how much time i have left for the way for the system to fail or to reach certain threshold so this information once this information is passed to the prognoser framework it will calculate the progn- it will calculate the remaining useful life for both the battery state of charge battery state of health and also the motor winding so we have the physics models for those so the physics models are simulated forward in time uh, using monte carlo simulations and particle filter which is something our framework does and then it's able to estimate that okay based on the my prognosis analysis the motor is the one which is not going to fail during this cycle the state of health looks good but yes the state of charge is the one which is going to the battery is going to discharge within the next 20 minutes and if my flight profile or my flight plan does incorporate that I'm going to land in 10 minutes based on my flight plan, then everything is good. Then you don't have to worry about any any issues. But then if that fault is of a higher magnitude, then in that case, if my prognosis estimate says that, okay, it's not 20 minutes, but we have to land in within eight minutes because then uh, we are going to reach that unsafe threshold. That's when the pilot or the autonomous system has to take a decision that do we need to land immediately and what is the nearest vertical port. And that's the part of the decision making, which is the third puzzle uh, piece of the puzzle where you do fault diagnosis, then you do prognosis. Once you have that prognostics estimate, can you? how do you use that information to take certain decisions? So do we need to land the vehicle to the nearest vertical port and then do a flight plan or a re- replan your flight path? So that's the third part. And we do work on all these three parts, but this was a new work what we actually did where we are trying to use it on minimal operations or at a very minimal computational footprint. And we are trying to use the same implementation on other projects where we are trying to use them on small satellites. We are using them on landers. We are trying to use them because there are so many complex systems. We don't need to do prognostics or do high computational uh, steps or tasks uh, every time. So these are these low computational tasks, but they are accurate enough to give you an idea that, okay, these are the potential candidates. And that's something, if you have that accurate information, we would be able to then take a detailed study and then do prognostics on that. And that's how the whole framework of system cells management works in. To end this, we have developed this tool and we it's available through NASA as a tool for being used. And I think uh, most of the time, whenever they anyone wants to use them, you can license it directly and it's more or less with no cost associated. It's just that there is some paperwork to be associated with that, but it's available for anyone to use it. So if we, anyone of you are interested, please reach out to this site and they can help you all with the next steps. So to conclude, the work presented is integration of FMEA into Bayesian network. And what we are trying to do is enhance the fault detection and isolation approach for any of these complex systems where you have very high complex systems, but how do you do that at a minimum computational expense? The broader goal is to develop a comprehensive tool where, as we talked about, to perform anomaly detection and then prognostic methodologies for multiple interactant systems for any of these and UAV type of vehicles. Though we apply it for UAM and UAV, the the whole framework can be applied to any of the uh, complex systems. So you don't have to have this specifically for your UAV. And the tool, what we have developed, it, it takes into consideration any other uh, subsystem also. There are different challenges in blending to different types so from FMEA to Bayesian networks. How do we blend them together? That's sometimes challenging because we need to identify relationships between the elements. We need to have that causal relationship available because if you have the causality information, then that helps you to identify and isolate faults. So that's a tedious piece, even from the small problem what we worked with. But that's what we are trying to do is how can it be more easier or simplified for the user to do it and then hard work is done by the tool and the user just needs to provide what the details of the systems are so that's what we are trying to achieving that as more and more users could use this tool with us associated and get the best results out of them for their 
uh, application. So it can be ground vehicles, it can be air vehicles, it can be complex systems, it can be used in medical applications, wherever you have these complex systems. So that's the whole goal of developing this part. With that, I thank you for your attention and thanks to the conference for giving me the opportunity and I'll be happy to answer any questions.